In Poor Things, Emma Stone plays Bella, a woman whose body is recovered by a mad doctor and has her unborn baby's brain transplanted into her skull. The poor things of the title are not the creatures like Bella, but instead the many men who obsess over her and try to possess her, and often end up destroyed by her. Bella is a Frankenstein, one in a long line of cinematic Frankensteins, and the film owes as much to the cinematic history of Frankenstein as it does to the original novel. And what makes Poor Things such an incredible experience, rich with detail, is the way it takes from the many Frankensteins that have come before it. The novel, the films, and even the story of its creator. Let's start back in 1818. There are details in Poor Things taken directly from Mary Shelley's Extraordinary Life. Based on the book by Alastair Gray, the plot of Poor Things follows Emma Stone's Bella Baxter, a Frankenstein trying to understand her place in the world, stuck in a body she is not ready for. See, Mary Shelley was a woman exploring the limits of what life had to offer. She came from affluent parents who were radical thinkers, and eventually married to Percy Shelley, a celebrated poet. The story of how Mary Shelley conceived of Frankenstein is infamous, so infamous, there are actually two movie versions of it. One, Haunted Summer, and the much more fun and bizarre Ken Russell movie, Gothic, which has a woman with eyeballs on her nipples so you got to see that one i said look into my eyes she had fallen absolutely head over heels in love with percy shelley a mad poet and spent a summer with him and the infamous Lord Byron, who was one of the models for, you know, one of the first versions of the vampire created by his friend, Dr. Jean Polidori, in the same summer that Mary Shelley created Frankenstein. They were all bored as it was a rainy summer and in order to pass the time, Lord Byron put a challenge up to his guests. Come up with a ghost story, uh, one to terrify us. Mary Shelley searched her brain for many days and couldn't come up with anything. And then she channeled the recent loss of her child into the story of Frankenstein, pitched the room and everybody was blown away. What blows me away is how a story can live so far beyond its original version. There have been thousands of versions of Frankenstein and thousands of stories inspired by Frankenstein. What's funny is in that haunted summer where all of these people are hanging out together, the least famous of them at, by far would have been Mary Shelley. And in now, hundreds of years later, her work has survived and outlived her husband's by far. I mean, when was the last time you read a Percy Shelley poem. Bella Baxter has less in common with the monster Frankenstein from the novel and more with the creator of Frankenstein herself, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Mary Shelley was a liberated woman who fled her father when he tried to keep her from being with the love of her life, Percy Shelley. She went on a whirlwind tour of Europe, experienced sexual and mental liberation similar to the tour Bella Baxter takes. Defoe's character, Godwin, is named after Mary Shelley's father, who, just like in Poor Things, tried to keep Mary from running off to Europe. Even the origins of where Godwin gets Bella's body may also have taken inspiration from Mary Shelley's life. You see, Mary Shelley was only able to marry Percy Shelley after Percy's first wife, pregnant with his child, tossed herself off of a bridge. I think Emma Stone is the perfect person to play a beautiful Frankenstein. I mean, she's just, she's a beautiful woman, but she, but almost in an odd way. Her eyes are so big and, and uh, you know, what really cracked me up and I could not stop thinking about when watching this movie is how much she looks like Sally from The Nightmare Before Christmas. I mean, she looks about as much like Sally as a human being can with the flat hair and the, with the big wide eyes and the flat hair and thin lips. She's, she is Sally. That's who you get to play a Frankenstein. But the first cinematic Frankenstein was definitely not beautiful. Let's go to 1910. Edison's Frankenstein might be the most hideous of them all. Second in line would be maybe Hammer House of Horror's take on Frankenstein, but we're not there yet. Edison Studios produced the first ever adaptation of Mary Shelley's work, where Charles Stanton Ogle played the monster. And this is the first time someone diverted from the book entirely and decided to come up with their own concept of what the monster looked like. The Frankenstein monster has taken many forms throughout the years, and very few pull from the description of the original novel. 
Instead, they take inspiration most likely from Boris Karloff's iconic interpretation. If you look at the novel, it talks of Frankenstein's yellow skin, but the Frankenstein we know and love is green. The green was determined by the makeup artist as the best color to make him look pale in black and white. It was only till years later that color photos from behind the scenes were leaked that Frankenstein began to get his green pallor. But the monster's look has taken many forms, from the almost comically grotesque portrayal in Edison's Frankenstein to Karloff's iconic version to Hammerhouse's absolutely nauseating monster. So Emma Stone looks nothing like a Frankenstein. The concept of poor things requires her to be desirable, and nobody wants to have sex with that, except maybe Mrs. Karloff. But Poor Things does get its mad doctor, not from the novel, but from the 1931 movie. Let's go to 1931. In Poor Things, Willem Dafoe plays Godwin, a variation on the mad doctor, who places the needs for scientific exploration above any and all morality or ethics. And the original Dr. Frankenstein from the book is not monstrous, but a handsome, brilliant doctor who lets the desire for scientific knowledge overpower his sense of ethics or morality. The origins of Frankenstein as a mad doctor can be traced to James Whale's Frankenstein. Maybe even further than the first iconic image of a mad doctor from which all other mad doctors are born. C.A. Rotwang from Fritz Lang's masterpiece, Metropolis. Whale deviated from Mary Shelley's story to follow the monster rather than focus on Frankenstein, taking the gothic romanticism and giving it a backseat to the tale of the monster. In Poor Things, Willem Dafoe's Godwin is sympathetic despite his horrific devotion to science. He himself is the victim of his father's experiments, a father who clearly did not care for him and instead used him as the subject of experiments removing vital organs just to see what the effect would be. This is why Godwin belches up bubbles. The 1931 Frankenstein created the iconic image of what we think of when we hear the name. Frankenstein was such a massive hit, it inspired sequels and reboots until the character eventually lost its ability to terrify and became funny. Let's jump to 1948. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. At this point, Frankenstein, having gone through so many different versions, so many unnecessary sequels, that uh, eventually he became a joke. An image often parodied. The movie Poor Things is infused with Yorgos Lanthimos's comic sensibilities. Yorgos is a funny director, funny and weird. One of the reasons the novel must have appealed to him so much is imagining the comic possibilities of a beautiful Frankenstein stumbling through the world. The monster's lumbering movements have always been a source of parody. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and turn the character into a joke, killing its ability to terrify. Bella Baxter's herky-jerky movements in the dance sequence are a continuation of the long history of Frankenstein becoming a joke. We can also see Frankenstein dancing in Young Frankenstein. The comedy and horror of Frankenstein coming from putting the mind of a child into a body it just does not know how to work. The beginning scenes we see Bella randomly hitting people, stabbing corpses, squishing toads, and generally acting like a spoiled child. This again takes its inspiration not from Mary Shelley's novel, but from the movie Frankenstein, where Frankenstein in an attempt to play with a little girl tosses her into a lake, killing her. Now for the look of poor things. Let's go to the novel, 1992. The novel, Poor Things, episodes from the early life of Archibald McCandless, MD, Scottish Public Health Officer, that's the full title, takes many of the themes from the original Frankenstein and expands on them, subverts some, turning them on their head. The original Frankenstein monster is upset with his maker for forcing him into a life he did not want. But Bella is the opposite. She is intoxicated with life and loves her creator. Even when she discovers the awful things he has done to her, she still has love for him. Victor Frankenstein rejects his creation because it is hideous with yellow skin and watery eyes and scars. He would wanted to make something beautiful. In Poor Things, this is inverted. What if Frankenstein is beautiful? Her beauty inspires desire and love in the men around her. The look of the film also takes a lot from the book. It has an unreal look that harkens back to the original movie, 
which was shot entirely on the Universal Studios back lot. This is the first movie Yorgos has shot on a soundstage, and he intentionally made the sets look fake. The film begins in stark black and white, and then is contrasted with oversaturated colors when Bella enters the real world. The sets are often deliberately fake looking, with painted backgrounds similar to what might be found on the Universal backlot, which often use matte paintings to create backgrounds too expensive to build. The over-the-top look also may be taken from the novel the movie is based on. The novel is told from the perspective of Bella Baxter's husband, played by Rami Youssef in the movie. At the end of the ridiculous tale involving Frankenstein's more sex than you can possibly want to see and a host of bizarre characters and circumstances, Bella reveals that her husband is making up stories about her, suggesting that her poor fool of a husband has concocted a life for her from the prevailing gothic and romantic motifs of the period. It positively stinks of all that was morbid in that most morbid of centuries, Bella says. In other words, the story is not real. The story does not take place in any reality, and the sets reflect this. The novel Poor Things and the film also expand on the themes of the original Frankenstein. Themes of ambition and challenging God and man becoming God. It expands on some of these themes and subverts some. Bella is like Godwin, her father, experimenting without limits. And in the end, she takes one last leap into the world of experimentation and it almost doesn't end well for her. This connects to the central theme of the original Frankenstein. At the end of the story, Victor Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, as the secondary title suggests, having lost everything to his experiment, tells his story to an explorer as a cautionary tale. He ends with the words spelling out the theme. Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example, how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge and how much happier that man is who believes his native town to be his world. And then he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. In other words, forget ambition. Live your life. Enjoy your life as it is. I would argue that although Mary Shelley put these cautionary words into the mouth of Victor Frankenstein, he's not right. I don't think Mary Shelley would believe that. He's a tragic hero. And one of the qualities of a tragic hero is they do not see their flaws until it is too late or sometimes not at all. His sin isn't flying too close to the sun. His sin is rejecting his child, rejecting what he does not understand. But poor things, just like her future husband, played by Rami Youssef, does not judge Bella for her early experiments. She is both a heroic character in the way she seeks out experience, and almost a tragic character when she finally pushes it too far. Poor Things expands and reinterprets the themes of the original novel, making something unique out of a story over 200 years old. A story that once again, for the thousandth time, is given a new life. It's alive! Oh, 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 oh.